up, everybody. You guys feeling good this morning? Man, I love the energy. I can tell you guys have already had energy drinks and coffee this morning. Uh, I was here last night, and there's so much excitement in the room, so much hunger in the room. Uh, it's like you could say anything, and you guys are just about it. Like, I could just be like, potato salad. <laughs> just like that. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to be with you guys today. Uh, I'm very honored and thankful. Uh, Pastor Charlie and Kelly, thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be with the Gateway family and everybody who's come from all over America. Uh, I was blown away hearing all the different cities and states represented in the room. Uh, I'm not going to try to hear every state again because there's a lot. Uh, but I'm, as I'm looking out in the room, I see a lot of cowboy hats. But I don't see a lot of country club outfits. Okay, okay, if you, if you came country, just stand up and make some noise. Okay, 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 okay. There's all the Texans right there. Yeah, if you came country club, make some noise and get up. Okay. Okay, you guys looking good. Uh, Yes, I'm proud. I'm proud of you guys. You guys are beautiful. Uh, well, this morning uh, I have a word for you guys. And so, uh, are we are we good? Are we excited to jump into the Word of God this morning? All right. Well, let's let's turn in your in your phones, in your Bibles, whatever you have. I know it'll be on the screen to Acts three one through seven. Uh, this is the text that we'll be uh, coming back to at the end of this morning. Uh, but I'm just going to read through it. Let's read together. It says, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. And Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. And the lame man looked at them, eagerly expecting some money. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. Say, I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. I came here this morning to tell you guys that it's easy to give away what you've already received. The title of today's message is The Hope of Glory. Will you pray with me? Go ahead and just bow your head, close your eyes. Uh, Holy Spirit, we want you to know you're the most welcome person in this room right now. We love you, Holy Spirit. You're welcome here. Lord, we want to know what pleases you this morning. So would you show us? Would you speak to us this morning? Uh, nobody came here this morning to hear me, and so we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. We need your voice this morning. We need your presence. Uh, all these lights, all these songs, a sermon, a teaching, none of this means anything if you don't come this morning. And so come and have your way in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen? Amen? Yeah. All right. Well, first thing I want to do this morning is I want to honor you guys. I want to honor this room. Uh, I know just there's a lot happening in the world around you. Uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. Uh, but you're in this room right now uh, because you're hungry because you love Jesus. I watched you guys worship Jesus this morning, and I was sitting there with tears in my eyes because it's so beautiful seeing how much you guys are after the heart of the Lord. And uh, there's a lot of people that have a lot of things to say about you guys, about this generation. Uh, but I was sitting here looking at you guys like, man, look at the beauty of what God is raising up, the beauty in this generation of what God is doing. And so, uh, so I want to honor you. You know, like, it's kind of like when, uh, when you compliment a little girl, anybody have like a little sister or like a little niece or something like that, and you tell them like, man, your hair looks so pretty today. And you guys know what happens next, right? So you say, your hair looks so pretty, and usually they're like, 
like an instantaneous runway model walk. Like it just gets real. Like as soon as you give a compliment, uh, the, the beauty that you compliment in that little girl, it gets amplified. Did you know that that's what honor does? Whatever you point honor at, it causes it to be amplified. Uh, the Bible actually says that honor is assigning heaven's value to something or to someone. That's what the word honor means. And so what I'm doing today, this morning to start, is I want to honor you. I, wanna know, I want you to know that I see heaven's value in you. I see heaven's value on your life. In fact, as I was preparing for this morning, I just kept asking the Lord, Lord, what do you have to say about this generation? What do you have to say about the students that will be in the room this morning? And uh, this is what he told me. He said that you're a generation of Davids destined to be giant slayers. That's what I heard him say about you this morning. I want you to just put your hand on your chest. Say, I'm a giant slayer. Uh, this isn't like what I just made up this morning. I didn't come here just like making up stuff. Like I asked God what he had to say about you. And that's what he told me about you this morning. Uh, in case you don't know this story about David uh, and the giant slayer, David, uh, th this is a little summary of what happens. Uh, David is this little boy and he's working, uh, tending sheep in his father's field. And he's just doing his job, you know, just tending sheep and all of a sudden, his father comes to him and says, hey, David, I need you to go take something to your brothers who are off at war. And they were off at war fighting against the Philistines. And basically, he said, go take them a Lunchable. That's literally what it says. I mean, it doesn't say Lunchable, but he said to take them some cheese. Y'all know what Lunchables are? Are they still cool? I mean, back in my day, we had Lunchables. My day wasn't that far away, but we had Lunchables. And so they, his dad said, David, go take Lunchables to your brother. Go take some cheese to your brothers. And so David takes the Lunchable. He goes to his brothers. And so imagine this. You're David. Your, brother, your brothers are off at war doing something so cool, and you're bringing the cheese. That's your assignment is to bring cheese to your cool warrior brothers. But he does it. He takes the cheese. He goes to his brothers. And it says that while he was there giving them the Lunchable, that he overheard these threats that were coming from this giant named Goliath. And he kept hearing this threat where he was telling them that he was going to kill them. And for 40 days, he had been threatening them and telling them that he was going to defy their God, which is our God. And so David decides, well, if nobody else is going to take this guy on, if nobody else is going to take Goliath, I will. And so he ends up getting called to Saul, the king, and Saul and him have a conversation, and then he gets sent off to go and fight Goliath. And I think it's interesting because in the story of David and Goliath, it's not actually the first time that we ever heard about the Philistines. They've been around for a while. It was just the first time that we saw somebody who was actually willing to step toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. And it was the first time that we saw someone slay a giant. And I want you to know that as God, what he, what he told me is that you're David's. You're giant slayers. What I see in you, what I believe the Lord was saying, was that you have the courage to step toe-to-toe -to -toe with giants in our nation and giants in the world that past generations have not had courage to step toe-to-toe -to -toe with. And I want you to know that that's your destiny. So when I think of things like sex trafficking and addiction and fatherlessness and suicide and racism, I look at you guys, and based off of what God told me about you guys, those are the giants that you're destined to take down. That's your assignment in the earth. Your, your personality, your drive, your passion, your desire, did you know all of it is a setup? How cool you are? Your cool outfits, I, was, I hope I, I tried to be cool like you guys. But like, like, everything about you is a setup. God created you for such a time as this and put an assignment on your life to take down giants in the land. What I, what I think is interesting about David in this story is that everybody focuses on what David had in his hands, right? So David took this giant down with a stone and a sling, which is crazy. So there's this huge giant, and David steps to him with a sling and stones. And he takes this sling, and he shoots it at, Dave, at Goliath, 
and it hits Goliath, one stone hits Goliath in the forehead. And then he falls. I don't know about you guys, but have you ever thrown a rock at somebody? You ever just thrown one stone at somebody? You guys would never do that. I know you would never do it, but your friend, somebody else that would throw a rock at somebody. Uh, I'm sure you've never seen a rock take somebody down. She said, oh, I have. You must have thrown a big rock, girl. But, like, like you throw a rock at somebody, and, and, and there's nothing special about a sling and a stone. There's nothing special about it. It's not big enough to take down a giant. So what I love about this story is that it wasn't about the sling and the stone. What it was actually about was David's relationship with God. That was what made the difference in the story. In 1 Samuel 17, 47, it says, David is saying this to Goliath. He says, all those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. David understood that it had nothing to do with the weapons that they were fighting with in the natural. He understood that everything, it had everything to do with his God. And the only reason that David knew that his God could do it was because he had history with God. I love the song that we were sang, singing about, He Won't Fail. I was singing that song and it was reminding me of all the times that God has blown my mind. All the times that I've seen him heal somebody, all the times that he set me free, all the times that he's done things in my family. And I started remembering my history with God. And I, I, it, what I love about David is David, he understood that because God did things before in his life, because of the relationship he had, that God was faithful to do things now in this moment with this giant. His history with God was his confidence. In fact, in 1 Samuel 17, 37, he actually tells us, he says, the Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of the Philistine. While he was with the sheep in the presence of God, it shows us that he had this moment where a lion came to him and a bear came to him. And it says that God himself rescued him out of the hand of the lion and the bear. That was the history. He said he knew it was God that did it. So if God rescued him from a lion and from a bear, why couldn't God take down a giant in front of him? It was his history with God that was his confidence. Here's another interesting thing about the story. The Israelites have been taunted by the Philistines for 40 days straight. So for 40 days straight, what is that? Five weeks-ish? Somewhere around there, a little over five weeks straight every single day. Somebody coming at you and just threatening your life every single day. And so the Israelites were full of fear. They were afraid because they had just been taking on these threats from the enemy. And so it was interesting because when David got sent to bring them this Lunchable and he overheard the threats of the enemy, he was appalled by Goliath's threats. He heard it one time and was like, whoa, who is this guy? Do you all recognize that he's threatening us when really he's threatening our God? Something was different about David. While everybody else had been consumed with the threats of the enemy, David had been with God. And so when the enemy spoke, he was able to recognize this is a lie. This is not God. He can't conquer our God. He was able to recognize truth because he had been with God. He'd been in the presence of God. I believe David got to know God as the victorious one through the lion and the bear moments. So he became a walking manifestation of the victory of God in the earth. Did you know that you will become whichever part of God you get to know? So if you get to know God as peace, you will walk in peace in the earth. If you get to know God as joy, you will walk in joy. When you walk into situations in your classroom with your friends where people are full of sadness and sorrow and depression, when you've encountered God as joy, you'll be able to walk in in the midst of a crazy situation and you'll just be smiling. Like that song said earlier, you'll be like, I don't even know, this doesn't even make sense. I just have a peace that doesn't make sense because I've been with God and I've gotten to know him as peace. So I carry that part of him because I know that part of him. I want you to know that this will be the testimony of your generation when we look back. You were giant slayers not because you had the right weapons 
or because you were the right pick or because you were strong enough or cool enough, but you were giant slayers because you knew your God. That's what the world will say about this generation. You're called to greatness. There's a scripture in Genesis 127 that says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. This is is so clear. It's saying that you were created in the image of God. And I'm sure you guys have realized this, but there's been a brutal attack on your identity and on the identity of your generation. A constant attack on identity, on who you are. And I want to tell you this morning, the reason that attack is happening is because the enemy is so afraid of you knowing who you are he's afraid of you in fact the most dangerous thing about you knowing your identity is that you don't actually have an identity defined on your own your identity is in his identity all you have to do is get to know God and you'll find out who you are that's the beauty of having God as our father is that your sons and daughters. James 1.17, it says that God is the father of lights. And then it says that you are children of the light, that you are destined to look like your father. What I love about sons and daughters, you know, like I can look at some of you and I can probably tell you what your mama and your daddy look like by just looking at your face because you look just like your mom. You look just like your dad. You know that person in your family? You're like, whoa, they look just like mom. It's kind of weird. Every time we see her, we see mom's face. Like, like that's what you're supposed to be in the earth, that when people look at you, they see your father. They see God. In fact, Romans 8 It says, for creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. That phrase, eager anticipation or eager expectation, it's portrayed as an Olympic runner straining their head forward to cross the finish line. It's it's this idea of this anticipation of getting to something greater. The word of God says that all creation is waiting like that for you to walk in the fullness of your identity. That they're looking, they're searching for you. It's like a violent looking, a violent searching. You ever lost your keys? Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. She just raised her hand. She's like, hey man, I'm lost. they're gone right now. I can't find them. Like, like. If you've ever lost your keys, or maybe for you guys, if you've ever lost your phone, there it is. There it is. I found it. You guys don't have cars. I see what's happening here. If you've ever lost your phone, I mean, you will flip every couch cushion. You will mess up papers, throw your book bag out. Like, you'll empty out everything to find your phone. It's a violent searching for something that is very valuable to you. That's what it says that creation is doing, waiting for you. That creation is eagerly anticipating your arrival. But that word children of God in that scripture, it means son or daughter, but it also means anyone sharing in the same nature of the father. So they're not just looking for you as you. They're not just waiting for you as you. They're waiting for you in your full identity as a son and a daughter of God, one who bears light like the father of light. You're destined to be light in the earth. It's part of your, your identity because you're, it's part of your father's identity. He is light. And what I love about light is that light illuminates. It brings life. Light brings direction. It brings hope. Light confronts darkness. I don't know about you guys, but I've never been in a situation where I've turned on a light switch in my house and the darkness stayed in there like, "Mm, I don't know if I'm gonna go. (laughs) Like, darkness does not battle with light. Light overcomes darkness. It says 
in John 1, 5, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. That is why when God walks into a room, no matter where you are, everything shifts. That's why there's moments in worship where we're singing to him, we're praising him, we're worshiping him, and then all of a sudden the hairs stand up on your arms. All of a sudden you get chill bumps. You're like, whoa, what was that? It's because he came in the room. And when he comes in the room, everything changes. When the light comes in the room, it says that the darkness can't comprehend it. The darkness, the anxiety in your life, the fear in your life, the suicidal thoughts in your mind literally run away when the light comes on. That's why it's hard. Like, like our, I don't know his name, but that awesome young man that was up here earlier, he was talking about how it's, it's crazy when you're thanking God and when you're in the presence of God, all of a sudden you can't find your fear anymore. You come to the altar and you came, you came in and you were scared and you were feeling all crazy. Somebody made you mad. You didn't stuck your seat, whatever happened. You're mad when you came in. And then somehow when you get into the presence of God, you start worshiping and you can't even remember what happened. Why? Because darkness can't comprehend the light. When light comes in, darkness has to go. The cool part about this is that you're called to be light. That means that when you walk into a room, darkness should leave. That when you walk into your home and there's chaos happening, that peace comes because you came in. That's your destiny. That's what it looks like when you're walking in the fullness of your identity. I remember when uh, this revelation hit me when I was in high school. And I started realizing, oh my gosh, I'm a, I'm a daughter. That's who I am. This is my destiny. So every day I would say, God, would you make me bright? Would you make me a light? Would you make me the type of light in my school that every time I, I walk into the school, the light that I feel in me through your presence, that it is revealed outside of me in my classroom? I started asking him that every day. And do, you, do you know he started to do it? He started to do it. People would come up to me and be like, I don't know, there's just a, a bright light about you. You're just, just something different about you. He started to do it. I remember going to this, uh, this going away party for a friend. And uh, a lot of the people at this going away party were outside. They were all hanging out. And a few of us were still inside in the living room at this event. And uh, this girl and I were sitting there just kind of talking, getting to know each other. And a group of girls walked in and they were like, they're talking to her. And they're like, hey, girl, we miss you. We've been partying, going out, and you haven't been coming with us. Where you been? She's like, oh, I've just been busy. Just got a lot going on. Just been, you know, focusing on school and stuff like that. And as soon as she said it in response to them, I heard the Lord say, she's lying. And he said, She's not going with them because she started walking with me and she's too ashamed to tell them. I said, oh, that's interesting. Lord, what do you want me to do with this information? And so the girls walked out. Me and this girl are still sitting there. And so I just, we we're just kind of chilling. And I said, hey, uh, why'd you lie to them? And she just looked at me, and she was like, what do you mean? I was like, don't play with me. I know you lied. You're lying. The reason you're not going out with them is because you started following Jesus, right? And she was like, how did you know that? I was like, because he told me. And she was like, well, yeah, I started walking with Jesus, and it's just really hard. I don't know what to do. I have all these dreams and these passions and my friends and all this stuff. And, and I want to be a part of all of it. I want to have my friends and I want to live my dreams out. And, and I want to follow Jesus. And I just don't think I can do all of that and follow Jesus. And it's just this really hard space that I'm in. She specifically felt called to do music. She's like, I, I want to make music, but I've never seen, like, somebody following Jesus make music and be cool at the same time. Uh, this is what she said. She's like, I don't feel like I'm supposed to do like worship music, but I feel like I'm supposed to make worship or music for God. And I don't know what to do with that. 
And I said, well, that's funny. That's what I do. And she was like, really? And I was like, yeah. She said, well, will you sing a song for me? Will you show me one of your songs? Do you have like your guitar or something? I'm like, yeah, it's funny, it's in my car. So I go to my car, I go grab my guitar, I come back into the room, and it's just me and her. So I'm like, cool, we're gonna have like a little, a little concert, just me and her, nobody else, nobody else at the party. And all of a sudden, the girl whose house we were at for the going away party, she comes in, she sees the guitar, and she said, are you about to sing? I was like, yeah, I am. She says, awesome. She runs outside. Hey, everybody, Jasmine's about to sing. Come on in. No. <laughs> I didn't want to sing for everybody. I just wanted to have a little intimate moment with me and my new friend. So this whole room is filled with people. I start singing this song. And I'm super nervous because groups of like 20 to 35 make me very nervous. I don't know about anybody else. I get like super nervous. So I'm like nervous, and I start singing the song, I close my eyes, and as I'm singing, I could feel the presence of God come into the room. The same thing you felt in worship. I could feel him in the room. And I open my eyes, and everybody in the room is crying. This was not at a church. It was not a worship service. This was at a going away party. And they're all crying, so I stop singing. I finish the song, and I just kind of sit there. Slowly start to put the guitar down, fade to black. You know, like this is awkward. And so I'm, I finish the song, and they say, well, somebody says, sing another one. Okay, pick the guitar back up. <laughs> start singing the song. And by this time, I'm like, I don't know if they're mad. I don't know if they hate my guts. If God, I, like, there's a, lot, there's a lot of emotions in the room right now. So I sing another song. Same, things, same thing happens. I feel just a wave of the presence of God come into the room, and I see tears just all over the room. And so this time I finish singing, and this girl comes up to me. She stands up. She walks over to me, and she says, hey, uh, I know we don't really know each other. My name's Moondrop. And she says, uh, I'm into, that's not her real name. Don't worry. I know y'all were wondering. <laughs> I heard it. It's not real. That's her nickname. Uh, and so she's like, I'm Moondrop. And she says, uh, I'm into auras and spiritualism. And uh, for those of you who don't know what that means, she's into witchcraft. Uh, that's what that means. And so she is, that's what she's telling me. She's like, I'm into auras and spiritualism, new age stuff. She has all these stones where she believes she can get peace from stones when really peace just comes from Jesus. And so she's doing, she's living in that world and that lifestyle. And she says, I know how to tell auras that are on people and what they're carrying and different things about them. And I said, okay, cool. And she says, but this really weird thing happened when you started singing, I saw this light on you. She said, but I see lights on people all the time, but this light was brighter than any other light that I've ever seen. Yeah. And it dawned on me, she didn't know Jesus, so she didn't have the language to articulate what she was experiencing. But her ability to say that it was the brightest light that she'd ever seen let me know loud and clear that she was talking about Jesus because he's the brightest light. That's who he is. And so this moment marked me in, in, in that room and one by one people started coming up to me and they were all living in these different lifestyles and different things but every one of them what they shared is what you carry is brighter than anything I've ever seen before and so throughout the night I got a chance to tell them about Jesus and the Lord continued doing beautiful things in the room but I want you to know the world is waiting for you to be revealed in your identity as a child of the light just like that those types of stories, I'm not, listen, I'm not different than you. There's nothing special about me. I'm on a stage, I got a mic in my hand, I got cool green pants that you don't have. But like, other than the pants, like there's nothing different than me. Like there's nothing special. The same way that that story happened for me, like that's what you're destined for. To be at a birthday party with your friends. And when your friends start talking about crazy stones and gems and auras and weird stuff, that you could show up and be like, oh, well, the brightest one is Jesus. Let's talk about that one. 
Like you're destined to be that kind of light. You're destined to be the one that when you walk in, they're all able to see there's something different about you. Because Jesus is inside of us. That's what makes us all different. And, and, and you need to know that while this is so exciting, you have to be aware of one thing. That you have an enemy who does not want you to live in your identity as a child of God. Uh, it's really important that you know that. John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, and I came that they would have life and to have it abundantly. So this tells us that your enemy, his only assignment is to steal, kill, and to destroy. He doesn't want you living in the fullness of your identity. He doesn't want anybody in your life snatched out of darkness. The enemy will do whatever it takes to stop both of those things from happening in your life. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And I wish I would have been more aware of the schemes of the enemy when I was your age so that I could be watchful. Because the older I got, what I realized is that the enemy, the way that he chose to try to come after my identity was through my family. When I was a little girl, my mom and dad divorced. My dad had two different families going on at the same time. He was having an affair with my mom, and he was on drugs. And so my mom got remarried to my stepfather, and my stepfather was an alcoholic and a drug addict. And so just about every day of my life for several years, I experienced verbal and physical abuse and just saw a lot of crazy things in my house. And because of what I saw at home, I struggled with this deep depression. I struggled with suicidal thoughts. Uh, I was not happy. I didn't have joy in my life. I was living in a dark place. Uh, in sixth grade, I almost got kicked out of the school that I was at. I went to a small private Christian school, and I almost got kicked out because I was trying to find love in little boys because I didn't have a father to tell me that I was worth it, that I was worthy of love, that I was, that I was valuable. And so I was looking for love everywhere else, and it almost costed me uh, the school that, that God had brought me into. And one day, I was in my bedroom, and... It was a situation where there was, there was a fight happening between my mom and my stepdad in my room or in their room. And I heard it in my bedroom. And this wasn't the first time that this type of moment had happened. But I'm sitting in my room and I said, God, I know you're real, but I really don't think you care. I don't think you care about me, about my house, about my family, about my personal life. Or else why wouldn't you do something about this? And I was in the place that Landon talked about earlier of just doubt and unbelief because of the situations that were happening in my life. And so I said, God, if you care, would you just let me feel your presence? Would you do something in the room so that I can tangibly know that you're real and you actually listen to me and you know me? And I sat in my room. I didn't really expect anything to happen because I didn't think he cared. But I was crazy enough to ask him. And the moment I said it, it was like a blanket fell on my body. Like not, like not a physical blanket, but it was like the presence of God. It, it felt like a blanket of warmth fell onto my body. And it was my first time experiencing the tangible presence of God. And I'll be honest with you, it scared the mess out of me. Because so I didn't think he was going to do it. So I'm sitting there, and I was like, whoa, what was that? It was him. He showed up. He actually came the way he said he would, that he would be near to the brokenhearted, and he was near to me in that moment and showed me his presence. I realized after that that the enemy sought to devour me. He sought to, to stop me from walking in the fullness of my identity and my calling and everything God had created for me by coming after my family. And some of you relate very much to the story that I just said. You have brokenness in your family, brokenness in your home. Some of you are super involved in sports and dance and different things outside of your home because you're actually afraid to go home. That's what I did. And the same God that encountered me is the same God that wants to encounter you, that wants to come for you, that wants you to know that he actually does care, that he's there with you. And that he is moving on your behalf. If the enemy can get to your family, he can get to your identity. If he can get to your identity, he can get to your intimacy with God. And if he can get to your intimacy with God, he can steal your destiny. 
I want you to know that that's one of the ways that the enemy tries your life is through your family. I wish I would have known that when I was your age. And I feel like the Lord told me to tell you the things that I wish somebody told me at your age. And that's one of the things that I wish somebody would have told me. In that scripture in John 10.10, 10, it then says that Jesus, Jesus says that he came to give life and to give it more abundantly. That word abundantly, it means beyond what is anticipated. It means that it exceeds your expectation. It goes past the expected limit. It's basically saying this, that while your generation is waiting in eager expectation for you, Jesus is giving you life, and he's giving you life more abundantly. What does that mean? It means that he's giving you enough for you and enough for the world that's around you. That it's life, and it's life more abundantly. Like, he doesn't want to do things in your generation without doing it in you first. He's jealous for you. He's jealous for your heart. So what I started doing after I had that encounter with God, I just thought, well, I guess I need to give away these encounters with everybody else. So I started giving away my encounters with God when I would encounter him as peace. Then I would tell somebody, hey, I, you seem like you're stressed out. I got to know God as peace. I felt his peace today. You want some of that? And they'd be like, yeah, cool, let's pray. Lord, give them peace. And they're like, oh, wow. <laughs> and it happens. He does it. I learned that God, he will do the same thing that he did in my life and that he does through my life. He'll do it in your life and that he desires to do that. And he did the same through Peter and John. That's in our main text that we're going to go back to right now. Uh, as I said before, it's easy to give away what you've already received. Worship team, you guys can come on up. This original passage from Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Again, it's Peter and John, and they're going towards the temple, and they see this man who's lame from birth at the gate called Beautiful. And this man, he begins to ask them for money. Peter and John looked at him. They said, look at us. And he was expecting money, and then Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I have, here you go. I just want to highlight that this lame man, he only knew to ask for money. But it's kind of odd, because what can you do as a lame man if you, don't, if you have money? What can you do with money as a lame man? What he needed, what he should have been asking for, is to walk. He actually needed healing. He needed a touch from Jesus. And I believe... In, in this generation, in my generation, we have this habit of, of asking for things that we don't need. And sometimes we're not actually aware of what we actually need. So we're asking for influence. We're asking for acceptance and stuff. But when all reality, we need life. We need Jesus to come and touch us. And for some of you, you have lame men in your life. There's people at your school. There's people in your family. There's people that you pass by every day, the coffee shop that you go to all the time, whatever it may be, that they're crying out like the lame man, and they think they know what they need, but really they're asking for a touch from Jesus. And God is calling you to be a Peter and a John that is able to discern, I know you're asking for this, but what I have, I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give you the father of lights. I'm going to give you the spirit of Jesus, what God has for you. Peter and John did something so beautiful in this moment. They looked at this man after he asked them for money. And what Peter said to him was, look at us. He called for his attention. I believe some of us, it's hard for us to see the lame men in our life because we're so consumed with social media. We're so consumed with what's happening on our phones. And God is calling us to be a generation that is able to say, look at us. Look at me in the eye. He's wanting you to look your generation in the eye so that you can give them what they are asking for. Or to give them what they actually need, what they don't even know to ask for. The man was looking for money, but he got life. Acts 3.6, Peter said, I'll give you what I have. They didn't just pray in Jesus' name for this man to be healed. They gave him an encounter with Jesus because they'd been walking with Jesus. They'd been encountering him. They knew him. So they were able to give away what they'd already received in him. This morning, the Lord just began to show me that 
Some of you, that you came in this morning and, and you feel like the lame man. You feel like the one who's been asking, who's been searching. And as I've been talking today, you're realizing, man, I don't think I actually need the thing that I think I need. I think I need a touch from Jesus. I think I need healing this morning. And I want to let you know that Jesus is in the room this morning. Right after worship, I looked over at some of my friends and I said, man, I'm so excited about what God wants to do this, this morning and through this entire day because I feel him here. He's in the room right now. So I want you to just get up on your feet. I want you to just close your eyes. I want you to know that Jesus is here this morning because there's things that he wants to do inside of you that he also desires to do through you. And if he can do it in you, he can get it through you to your generation. That there are giants that will be slayed through your lives because there's giants that will be slayed in you. Things that you're going to conquer because of Christ in you, because the spirit of God living inside of you. So with every eye closed, if you're the one that feels like the lame man who's in need of healing this morning, who's in need of a touch from Jesus, maybe you've been looking for the approval of others, maybe you've been looking for more followers, for relationships, but you actually need Jesus. What I want you to do right now, if that's you, if you just feel that kind of tugging, that, that kick in your, in your gut, in your spirit right now, if your heart's pounding in your chest, I just want you to make your way to the altar right now. I believe the King of glory, Jesus, He's going to encounter you this morning, that he's going to bring healing. He's going to bring deliverance. What I want you to do is just lift your hands to him. And he's going to begin to show you the things that are in your heart that have kept you from walking, that have kept you from living the fears that you've had, the, the addictions that you've had, the anxiety that you struggle with. Like I said earlier, did you know that when the presence of God is here, that darkness can't comprehend the light? And so with every one of those hands lifted, I'm just going to ask if you have students that just came down to the altar, different youth pastors and youth leaders or uh, ministry team from Gateway, I want to ask you to come down and just begin to pray for these students. Just begin to lay hands on these students and just contend with them for healing, for breakthrough in the room right now. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you're the spirit of Jesus. That you're the one who heals, that you're the one who delivers. And so right now, I just declare healing in the room. Come on, if you're in the room and you're not down here at the altar, just begin to pray with me. If you have your personal prayer language, you can pray in that at your seat. If you want to just pray out loud in, in English, pray with me for the kids that are at the altar right now. These are the ones, as I was just saying, Davids in our generation that we're going to take down giants. And so, Lord, we just thank you for your generation. I declare healing in the room right now. Man, you could just come with me. I just declared deliverance right now. What I saw in the spirit as I was praying into this, this session, I saw people being set free of, of cigarette addictions. I saw a student in the room that you've been sneaking and smoking cigarettes. And Jesus is here this morning to let you know that he sees you. He's not mad at you, but this morning he's going to set you free of that addiction. So if that's you, just ask him. Just invite him. Say, Lord, set me free. 
I saw someone in the room this morning as I was praying that you had a car accident and because of your car accident you haven't been able to turn your head to the left this morning God wants to heal your physical body guys that's what's beautiful about God is that he doesn't just heal one part of us what he does is he heals our body our soul and our spirit he's a God that heals our entire being at one time so if you need a physical healing in the room and you're even in the crowd right now I just want you to lift your hands Jesus we need you this morning come ask the healer walk through every seat walk through every aisle and heal your sons and your daughters we thank you for your deliverance in the room we thank you for your healing in the room come on I just want to sing this champion now go ahead and sing it out for us just one time you are God. Yeah. you are my champion Giants fall when you stand undefeated. Every battle you've won, oh I am. I am who you say I am. Then you crown me with confidence. I am seated in the heavenly place, undefeated with the one you are. Oh, you are yes, you are. I saw I saw God healing people from eating disorders 
So I was praying into this weekend. I just kept hearing it over and over again, eating disorders. I don't want to embarrass anybody. There's no shame in Christ. But if that's you, if you've been struggling with that, I want you to raise your hand. Jesus is here to set you free this morning. If you're around somebody with their hand lifted, put your hand on their shoulder and just pray for them. Come on, put your hand on their shoulder. Jesus, we just declare that you're the healer, that eating disorders can't live in your presence. And so right now, Spirit of Jesus, do what only you can do in the room. We declare healing. We declare a new revelation of identity. Would you show them who they are as sons and daughters in the room? We just declare that eating disorders cannot stay in the presence of God. That you have to go. That no spirit is welcome here but the Holy Spirit. So King of glory, come fill them with light even in their boldness, in their faith. Would you meet them in their faith this morning? Meet them in their faith this morning. The last thing that I saw before we close, I saw that there were some of you in the room that as you heard me tell that story about being in the room with those girls and the presence of God showing up and talking about asking God to make me a light in my school. That for some of you, it stirred up a hunger in you. That you wanna see God move in your life. You wanna see him move through your life. You wanna see things change when you walk into the room. And he wants to do it through you. But the way it works is through his spirit. It works through him. The Bible says that it's Christ in you the hope of glory. And so what we do right now is we ask him to fill us with his spirit. And what happens is when he fills us with his spirit, everything that comes with his spirit, we have access to. What comes with the spirit, one of the things that comes with his spirit is the gifts of the spirit. That means that word of knowledge and words of wisdom and prophetic healing, that there's all these things that he wants to do through your life because of the spirit of Jesus inside of you. And so if you're hungry for the spirit of Jesus to move through your life like that right now, if you want to be filled with the spirit of God, I want you to raise your hands. I don't know if you guys even just felt that shift in the room when the hands went up. I just felt a shift in the room. The, the, the Holy Spirit is here right now. And he's faithful. We're just going to start singing this song. It's called Fill Me Up. It's a simple song where you just begin to invite him to fill you up. And as we sing this song, some of you are going to encounter the tangible presence of God like you've never felt his presence before. He's going to meet you right now in your faith, and he's going to fill you with his spirit. And you're never going to be the same because the spirit of Jesus will be living inside of you. There's some of you that are listening to me right now, you're like, I've already been filled with the Spirit. Well, you're about to get a refreshing. He's gonna fill you in a new way. That's what he wants for you this morning. So come on, if you want that this morning, just lift your hands. And we're just gonna get to sing, fill me up. I'm just gonna ask him this morning. So fill me up, fill me up. Every voice, sing it out, sing, feel me.
sing, fill me up. So Holy Spirit, we just thank you for your presence. Thank you for filling your sons and daughters. We love your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, we just thank you for breathing on us this morning. Lord, we just say we want everything you have. Jesus, everything you paid for on the cross, all the healing, all the deliverance, everything that comes with your spirit, we want all of it, Lord. And the last thing I'll say, just I even felt like for the youth leaders and the youth pastors that are in the room, I felt the Lord wanting to challenge you that you didn't just come here this weekend for your students to get a touch from the Lord that he wants to minister to you this morning. He wants to minister to you this weekend. And so, Lord, students, could you do me a favor? If you're not still in the middle of just a moment with Jesus, would you stretch your hands to your youth pastors, your youth pastor, your youth leaders, whoever you came with, stretch your hands towards them right now. And let's just pray for them. Lord, we pray for our youth pastors. We pray for the youth leaders. And we just say there's more than enough, that there's no limits in you. Would you fill them with your presence? I pray for a refreshing to come now. Your word says that you refresh those who refresh others. So would you refresh those who have been refreshing us, Lord? We bless them. We honor them. And Lord, we love you and we thank you for your presence this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.